Good evening. It's good to have everybody here again tonight. And I hope that what we're talking about in this series is going to help all of us to be more <laughs> devoted in our service to God, more zealous for Him. Last night, we talked about preparing ourselves to be zealous. How we need to purify our hearts and really focus on what is important and make a decision that will take action and get the things out of our life that are keeping us from being zealous. And so now we can move on to really lighting that fire of zeal. In James chapter 4 and verse 8, James says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He's going to help you cleanse and purify yourself. In this diagram that we looked at last night, we looked at how to start a fire or to have a fire, you need three things. You need the proper environment where it has enough air, it's not too wet. You need heat. And you need the fuel that will burn. When you have those three things together, you have fire. Well, last night we were talking about getting our environment to have zeal correct. And tonight we're going to look at the other two parts. The heat source, who is God. And then we're going to look at the fuel that is going to burn in our zeal. When we look at, at God being the one who heats us up in our zeal. The question is, how does he do that? How does God make us to be zealous? There's the idea in much of the religious world that he just sends the Holy Spirit into you and just gets you all excited. That's not how he does it. God inspires zeal in us through his zeal for us. God gave his son to die for us. You can't get any more zealous than that. And we should have that same kind of zeal that he has. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. 
Uthi ukuba ngiyanishisekela ngokushisekela kaNkulu Nkulu ngokuba ngalindisela indodene yodwa ukuba nginisi ku Christ ni indombi emhlophe. Now this is a different word here, jealous, not yes. zealous. But, but the idea is very much the same. When you have jealousy, you you are driven to uh, to not let whatever it is that you're jealous for to be used for something else. So if you're jealous towards your wife, you don't want other men uh, having her. And that's proper jealousy. And God is a jealous God. But zeal is part of that. Because jealousy is sort of a, the push to be zealous. And so Paul says he has that same kind of feeling towards God's people that God has towards them. And we should have that same kind of motivation, that same kind of zeal towards our brethren that we want everyone to be serving Christ in pureness. In Malachi chapter 3, in verse 3, it, it's a prophecy about Jesus. And it says he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Jesus is a the this smelter where they melt the metal and purify it. He's the heat that's being applied to his people to pre to purify them, to heat them up. Of course, there's one way that this is done in punishment. <laughs> to actually destroy the, the people who are not pure. In, in Matthew 3, verse 12, it says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Should that motivate us? Knowing the punishment of God, that should motivate us to be zealous for him. For two different reasons. One, because we don't want that punishment. And the other, because we don't want that punishment for anyone else either. Because that's how God is. He doesn't want that punishment for anyone. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's how God is. That's his zeal. And that 
should motivate no, us to be like him. He was patient with us so that we could come to repentance. Now what are we going to do with it? Let's be zealous. Let's let that drive us. But when we talk about drawing near to God, how are we going to do that? Well, there's really only one way. And that's through Jesus. People can think, well, I'll draw near to God in my own way, you do it in your way, and we're, we'll be fine. But the only way to draw near to God is through Jesus. In John 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip said to him, I said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has sent me has seen the Father. Uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? When we talk about drawing near to God, getting to know him for who he truly is, how are we going to really know God? By really knowing Jesus. Because Jesus looks just like the Father in his character. Every decision that he made, that was the kind of decision that the Father would have made. When we know him, we'll know the Father. In John 14 and verse 6, 14 and verse 6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's the only way to draw near to God. You can't draw near through the ancestors. Not through any religious leader, not through TB Joshua. <laughs> or somebody who gets you to drink petrol. You have to draw near through Jesus. You cannot come to God through your parents' faith. You can come to church and you know your parents are very you know faithful people. And that's great. That's a good example for you. But that's not going to get you close to God. You can't get there that way. You can't get close to God by just keeping certain laws. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm careful that I don't steal. I don't lie. I am very generous in my giving. That's not how you draw near to God. Those, those are things you'll do if you are near to God. But that's not going to get you to Him. It's not through coming to church. Yes, you may learn about how to draw near to Him when you come to church. But coming to church isn't getting you any closer to God it's not even listening to the best preachers people come and they, they hear a really good sermon 
They think, oh, that just brought me so much closer to God. Well, if you put it into practice and you truly give yourself to God in those things, that does. But just hearing the sermon isn't going to do it. You must first die with Christ to come near to God. That's done through baptism. We're not going there, but you can read all about it in Romans 6 if you don't know it already. But this zeal that God has, that he gave his own son to die for us, when we really understand that, that should set us on fire and make us want to live every moment for him. In Titus chapter 2, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. <laughs> He says here that the grace of God has appeared. Well, grace is all about forgiveness and love and all of that, right? And in fact, it is. But he says that this grace teaches us to get sin out of our lives. When you've received the grace of God, that should be motivation to get all of these worthless things out of your life. And he says, when Jesus gave himself to redeem us, it wasn't just to forgive our sins, but it was to, to purify us, to be zealous for good deeds. That should set us on fire. Again, in James 4 and verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's what we must do. And if we do make that step to get to know God and to live for him, he promises he will draw near to us. He will provide what we need to live a zealous life. Now let's talk about the fuel. What we're going to burn when we're on fire for God. Now, we're talking about the, the character of Christ that we're supposed to put on in our lives. And really, we could look at the whole New Testament to see what that's supposed to be. Tonight, we're just looking at a few things that are directly connected to making sure our zeal is proper. And so, 
the things we're going to look at are wisdom, loving service, courage, energy, and diligence. And with those characteristics, it's going to, to make our zeal burn in the right way. If we look at wisdom, why do we need wisdom in our zeal? Well, if you think about fire, if it's in the bright stand, that's good. But if it's on the floor in the middle of your house, that's not good, is it? You're going to burn the house down. Okay. We need limits, proper limits. Where this, this fire is going to work. And wisdom teaches us about how to use zeal in the proper way, what the limits to that zeal are. So where do we get zeal? Well, in James 1 verse 5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask of God. Do you need to, do you need to go to university to get wisdom? Not godly wisdom. You're not going to find that in the university. You're going to find it in the Word of God. He teaches you how to apply your zeal properly. And he promises if you ask God, and he goes on to say without doubting, God will, God will give you wisdom. Okay, and so we, we need to, to look for it from him. And James 3 teaches us something about what this wisdom is like. James 3 verse 17 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. So think about what you want to do in your zeal. And see if it fits in the limits of this wisdom from God. Is it pure? Is it peaceable? Just because you're zealous for God doesn't mean you you're supposed to be a troublemaker. Is it gentle? Are you trying to beat people over the head because they're not doing things the right way? Is it reasonable? Are you just getting full of an idea without thinking it through and trying to go ahead with it? We need to be reasonable. <laughs> Is it full of mercy and good fruits? <laughs> What's your motivation in your zeal? <laughs> Is it going to, to help people? <laughs> Is it unwavering? Is it without hypocrisy? Those things will help us guide our zeal in the right way. 
ikwazi ukulawula intshisekelo yethu iye indawo nefana lekileyo and our zeal must be pure and holy yabona intshisekelo yethu ifana ke ibe mhlophe ibe ngcwe in romans 3 verse 8 Paul said, and why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. In your zeal do you say let us do evil that good may come? You have people who are zealous to convert others to Christ. And so they they make things up, they tell lies. They say, well you know we found the ark of the covenant. I mean, not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Noah's Ark. That's proof of the flood. You must believe now, because we have this proof. It turns out later they made it all up. There's a brother in Christ who made a recent trip up on Mount Ararat. He came back and he was telling people that they found the ark. But they were supposed to release their findings several months ago and I don't think they ever had. I just you, you have to be careful. Make sure that When what you're doing is show, right. Yeah. Not just what the outcome you intend is right, but what you're doing is right. Their condemnation is just. That is not something we can say. We need wisdom in our zeal. We also need loving service in our zeal. Zeal is worthless without love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Bubu tu Paul chingo ba sekunde wakala titi nwanja tri. Nama nkulu manga slim zabat nesa singeros. Kepa nge na rutando ni tu sekke nga zame nzimbe nunga chai. Nama ngino prophet and kondisi pishaka lo zonke no was zonke. Nama ngino kolo zonke. Nama kupa nga kujusi zinda. Kepa nge na rutando angindo ya luto. Nama nga bela pa mpofu onke nako. Nama ngigele mzimba wa mkushi iswe. Kepa nge na rutando agungisizi maluto. Look at these things he's doing. Speaks with the tongues of men and angels. He has a gift of prophecies. He knows all mysteries and all knowledge. And he has all faith. But he, he says also he gives all of his possessions to the poor. And he gives his own body to be burned. <laughs> That's a zealous person, isn't it? But he says, if he does not have love, in all of those things, it's nothing. It's worth nothing to him. Zeal is worth nothing without love. 
We have to have that motivating our zeal. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we have the record here of a zealous church. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he talks here about this, the churches in Macedonia who were very poor but were giving a lot for the, the brethren in, in Judea, uh, Judea who needed help. It says they gave above their ability. But at the end of it, he says, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. If you give all of this, you're sacrificing a lot, that's great. But he says, first, they gave themselves to us and to the Lord. They did this because of their love. And zeal should be about serving. Our zeal isn't about doing things for us, it's about doing things for others. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. He says, be fervent in spirit. That zeal, isn't it? And he says, do that serving the Lord. We are servants. Not servants like when you go to work for a boss. You negotiate your pay. You can make certain demands from your employer. We're slaves. In Luke 17, this is something that Jesus tried to get across very clearly. And so he talks about this one who... Uh, he goes out and he plows, he tends the sheep. He comes back in and the, the master tells him, now fix me something to eat. Okay, and so when he does that, he doesn't even thank the slave. Because he's his slave. He's supposed to do what he tells him. He says at the end, this is what you should say. When you've done everything that you've been commanded. We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. In our zeal for God, we need to recognize that it is not our decision to do these things, really. We do decide. But God has made the choice for us. If you want to serve Him, this is what you do. We are his slaves. He has bought us with the blood of Christ. 
We must serve in love. And we need courage if we're going to have proper zeal. You see this in Jesus' life over and over again. Standing up to the leaders of the nation, even. Because of his zeal for God. But how, well, yeah, we can't be zealous without courage. If you think about David when he went against, against Goliath, he was being zealous for God. But that took courage. To go out as a young, inexperienced soldier. And fight the older, huge, very experienced soldier. But he did it because of his wow. zeal. Okay. But he had courage to back that zeal up. You think about Gideon. He started off without courage. And then he gained courage to, to do what God wanted him to do. This is just, we'll quickly go through how he gained courage. <laughs> and this will be good to, to look at more in depth another time. But Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. They had a huge army that was against them, and they didn't have an army. And God told Gideon, I want you to, to get an army together and go fight. When God talked to him, he was hiding in the wine press, threshing the grain. And he was not at all sure about doing what God told him. But the first thing, when we're, we're building up courage, is we need to recognize our, the reality of the situation. If you do what you know God wants you to do, you may die. Alright, we know that. Now what? Confirm God's will. What was it that Gideon did? <laughs> he, he got God to do a miracle for him to what prove what, what he was wanting. We don't have to do that. We have it all written down in his word. We can know. This is what God wants us to do. He started small. God said, okay, first go and tear down the idol in your father's yard. That's a lot easier than going up against this huge army. He was afraid to do that too. He did it at night. But it turned out great afterwards. His father even defended him to the people when they wanted to kill him for it. And so he... Starts building up his confidence. When you start out being zealous for God, you don't go have to go preach to Mugabe. Which, by the way, is something that uh, Larry Vincent's trying to, to get an appointment with him through his treasurer uh, so that he can preach to it. <laughs> but you can start off with something smaller 
and work your way up in your courage. And then you can confirm God's will again. Make sure this is what God wants you to do. <laughs> and then get to work. Gather the resources. He got the army together. But he had to depend on God. God only let him take 300 men to fight. But he did it and they wiped out that huge army. We can build up our courage if we don't have it. We need courage to truly be zealous. And we need energy. If you're being zealous, it means you're being active. You're doing things for the Lord. But how, why don't we have energy? Well, Mkulu is talking about he doesn't have, he doesn't feel very zealous because it takes so much energy. Well, there's something to say, you know, for old age anyway. <laughs> but those of us who are younger, we should have energy for this, right? Well, yeah. why don't we? It's because we're spending our energy on other things, isn't it? We need to have maturity to decide what we're going to spend our energy on. If, if we really make the decisions to put away those things that are taking our energy away from serving God, even if those things aren't wrong in themselves, playing soccer or whatever it is, if that's, if that's not leaving us with the energy to do good things for the Lord, Let's put it away. Then we'll have more energy to be zealous. And we need to be emotionally involved in the will of God. When somebody threatens you, you're, you suddenly have more energy, don't you? Because that affects your emotions. <laughs> and it, it gives you adrenaline. Yeah. We, we, we have that burst of energy because we're emotionally connected. And in Psalm 119, in verse 136, David said, my, my eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. He was emotional about the will of God. When people are breaking God's word, how does it make you feel? Does it bother you at all? We need it to bother us. And then in verse 139 and 140, he says, My zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore, your servant loves it. When we get our hearts to where it really gives us an emotion when we see the law of God being broken. We will become 
energetic in our zeal. Our zeal will consume us, he says. We also need diligence. We need to work with a goal in mind. Being careful to do what's right. In Romans 12, verse 11, he says, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. In our zeal, we need diligence. In Proverbs chapter 6, we see an example given of someone who's diligent. And in this case, that's the ant. Why does the ant always seem to be busy? Because he's preparing. He's gathering food. Because he's looking forward to a time when he can't find food anymore. We need to work with the end in mind. Think about the goal. We're not going to be here forever. And there's going to be a time when we're old and we don't have all the energy. Or when we no. have an accident and we're crippled and we can't do what we could do before. But while we have ability now, we need to be busy. This is what Jesus said. In John 9 verse 4, he said, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. When we have time, that's when we need to be active. We don't need to keep putting things off. Make your proper priorities now. Make the things that are important to God important to you now. And do that work. Because there's a time coming when you won't be able to do it anymore. And in fact, there's a judgment day when no one will be able to do it anymore. Let's be ready. Draw near to God. He will light your fire. He's, he provides the heat for our zeal. And add these characteristics that we see in Christ to our zeal to fuel it. And then as we go on through life, keep adding other things as we see it from Christ. We'll have a good, strong fire burning. All right. Thank you.